Right then, last but not least, paper three of the first set of specimen papers. This is the third paper I would have done today, um, so I am flagging a little bit, but it's fine. I love chemistry, I love doing papers, so this is this is a dream actually. Um, third paper, same drill as before. It's a two-hour paper. There are 90 marks, even less. So 90 marks and 120 minutes worth of time. However, this one has quite a considerable number of multiple choice questions. So if you've done the AS papers where they have sort of the end of both AS papers is multiple choice. This one is, again, the end. There's five main questions and the end is, there's about, oh, I don't know how many now. Just have a quick look. There's a, oh, 29, 30 multiple choice questions, which are pretty hard, actually. They're pretty hard. This paper is a synoptic paper, which means it can draw from any content of the entire specification, from year one or year two, from physical, inorganic, or uh, physical, inorganic, or organic, uh, and it's likely to have a more sort of practical slant on things. So it's less theory based in theory, but it still obviously will be based around theory, but it will tend to gear towards sort of more of the practical, the assessed practicals, and things like that. So anyway, here we go, paper three, straight into it practical type question uh, talking about reflux this one is talking about the oxidation of ethanol so you can see that ethanol is oxidized to ethanol and then to ethanoic acid which is classic alcohol oxidation of alcohols year one content uh, it's a two-step process and it's done in order to to make sure the oxidation to ethanoic acid is complete it's done under reflux and basically describe what happens when uh, a reaction mixture is refluxed why it is necessary in this particular case uh, for the oxidation of the um, ethanol to ethanoic acid so what is reflux? So, basically describe what happens. So it's, we're not going to worry about diagrams and things. You could draw a diagram, I suppose, if you really wanted to. But the, the key principle is that you you are continually boiling the, uh, oh, what are we doing there? The reaction mixture. The idea being that you know, it's a prolonged process. It's not a couple of minutes. You're doing it time and time again. You would do some reflux because, obviously, when you're boiling something, you're turning it from a liquid into a gas. Now, in order for this oxidation to take to take place completely, you want to make sure that every single bit of it is oxidized and continued. Now, you could do that by trapping in a container, but the problem is that when you vaporize something and obviously a gas is produced, pressure is going to increase. That container could, in theory, explode. So that's not very safe. This, though, allows for sort of pressure equilibration. There's no sort of real big difference in pressure because uh, what happens is vapor obviously is formed, and that vapor ultimately then condenses back into. mixture in the flask and that means that if say if we did this usual sort of distillation process then what we would do is as we reacted the ethanol with the the dichromate what would happen is the ethanol would be produced and that would be distilled across but we actually want to make sure that any ethanol that is produced goes back down and is back in contact with the dichromate is back oxidized again so we've got vapors formed then it condenses back to the mixture in the flask um, and so basically any ethanol or ethanol particularly that has vaporized can essentially I never know if there's an U in vaporized or not can be condensed and oxidized fully basically there you go Loads of space for that, no need for it at all. So there you go, that's a nice easy question there. Reflux, obviously you do so with an upside down condenser is the way you normally do it. You may have done it in school, I can't think if it's one of the required practicals or not, it might be. Uh, right half equation for the overall oxidation of ethanol into ethanoic acid. Uh, so half equation here, so what we're doing is we're turning ethanol, CH3, CH2OH, uh, we're turning that into ethanoic acid, so CH3, COOH, of course, we've got an extra oxygen there, so we'll balance that up using a cheeky little water there. 
And of course now we've got three, five, six, seven, eight, three, four. So we need to hold four hydrogen ions there and balance up the charges using electrons. Bish bash bosh, Bob's your uncle. Done. One mark. 1.3. Boiling points of the organic compounds in a reaction mixture are shown in table one. So stick on this idea of ethanol and all the rest of it. Really sort of sort of uh, monopolizing? That's not the right monetizing? I don't know either way. Anyway. Basically, how could you use this data to describe to basically uh, obtain a sample of ethanol from a mixture of these three compounds, including your answer description of the apparatus you would use and how you'd minimize the loss of oil? You could use a labeled sketch or whatever. I would probably suggest doing a, a, a nice little sketch on this one. I would, I would have some sort of army type thing like uh, that. This isn't going to be beautiful, but I can deal with that. Uh, and I'd probably have down here something like that. Oh, that is that is a work of art. It's not really though, because I've forgotten to do something. Oh, don't do this to me. Oh, I'm having a nightmare here. Uh, what? What? Key thing is here as well. It says including your answer, description, of breaks you would be able to, and how you would minimise the loss of ethanol. That is very important. So, what I'd say, diagram, stick some labels in, and that you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. So this here, that is a thermometer. This is water in this one of course is water out bear in mind we obviously have this oh, stop doing that you are doing my head in something like this and then that would go into some sort of kind of little thing like that probably do a little conical flask I'll tell you what I should probably do art videos at this a little and these are ice cubes look at those ice water bath the reason is that I want to make sure that any ethanol that is produced does not vaporize and that it remains as a liquid so I'm keeping it nice and cold down there that's really what I want I want it nice and nice and nice and nice and cold nice and cold uh, I'd probably do something like this reaction. I'd probably say there to stop evaporation. Something like that. I'm trying to make a nice bit of pace here because I want to get onto those multiple choice questions. ASAP. I want at least, I don't know, I'd say probably want at least 40 minutes for those. Probably more than that, 45 minutes maybe for the multiple choice questions. And we'll see where we're at in a minute. So. I've got a suitable flask here. I've got a thermometer. That's very, very important. Absolutely crucial there. Uh, I've got a condenser, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and I'd probably, I'd probably put something here. Uh, I'd probably make, a, make it just a general comment here. Heat, I'd perhaps say reaction mixture actually. Heat reaction mixture. Ah, uh, do you know what? What an absolute mess this is. Heat reaction mixture to 21 degrees Celsius and maintain. Basically, I want to get the ethanol to be produced and maintain in order to evaporate ethanol that's nice I think that's alright there that's beautiful doesn't need loads of words I've got loads of detail there all my diagram looks okay it's not that pretty but it, it makes the point I've got my key things there I've labelled up what I've got you could always label this as condenser uh, you could stick flask on there if you really want to uh, conical flask you could be really picky you could say round bottomed flask if you really want to stick the extra detail in 
five reasonably easy marks there for what is just an absolute cracker of a diagram. I think I might start going into chemistry, yeah, chemistry art. Anyway, moving on, question one does continue. So use your knowledge of structure and bonding to explain what is possible to separate ethanol in this way. So this is very much a theory question now, based around intermolecular forces. And remember that we're comparing ethanol, we're comparing ethanol, and we're comparing ethanoic acid. Look back at the boiling point, you'll see that ethanol is considerably lower than the other two. And the reason is that these two have hydrogen bonding through the OH groups they have. Ethanol has no OH group, it only has that carbonyl group. So you could say something like no H bonding in ethanol. Make sure it's really clear that it's ethanol that you're talking about there. Uh, Whereas there is in ethanol and ethanoic acid, uh, H bonding stronger. Always give this idea of comparative than. Uh, Dipole, dipole, which would be of course present because of the carbonyl group there, so it's stronger than dipole, dipole. Uh, I think that's it, two nice marks there. Fairly straightforward, easy one, very theory based. Okay, a student obtained a sample of liquid using the apparatus in question at 1.3. So that's my nice drawing that I had. Describe how the student could use chemical tests to confirm that the liquid contained ethanol and did not contain ethanoic acid. Right then. Okay. So what we're going to do is we need to add something to obviously test. So I would say, oh, easy test, uh, add Tollens reagent. Uh, if ethanol, silver mirror, I'm trying to work out where the five marks are going to be here. So you get a silver mirror if it was uh oh and a warm a bit of a picky mark there but there we go that's probably three marks i think there and then so not ethanoic acid so we would add uh sodium carbonate named metal carbonate uh, uh no Fizzing scene. That is a ridiculously easy five marks. Look at all that space. It's a joke. That's what you're done. Tollens reagent and warm. Ethanol would give you silver mirror. Add sodium carbonate, you'd get no fizz in there. Really, really easy. Lovely job. Let's go down. Question two. They love ethanol, ethanoic acid, don't they? Ethanol and ethanoic react reversibly to form ethyl ethanol in water according to the equation. There it is. Esterification. A mixture. Nice. The equilibrium is mixed place in a graduated flask and the volume made up to 200 centimetres. A 10 centimetre cube sample of this equilibrium. Oh no. It's titrated with sodium hydroxide added from a bureau. Oh no. Oh no. Oh dear. Um, uh, <laughs> so we're starting with an equilibrium mixture and then we're working our way through to try and work out KC. Okay. So temperature's fine, that's remaining constant, so K is not going to change in that whole time. We can do this. We can do this. Okay, so we're what we're, our first thing we're going to be doing is, so essentially what we need to know, to work out our KC, we need, remember that KC is going to be based around our equilibrium expression, which is going to be products over reactants and it's got to be concentrations, obviously multiplied together and taken into account any coefficients, which there are none, so that's fine. So we've got a one-to-one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one -to -one ratio, one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio reaction there. <laughs> we need the concentrations, therefore, of these and of these. We know what our volume is going to be, so we can work out a concentration, but we need to know the molar values of each of these, otherwise we're not going to get there. So, what we're going to do 
is we're going to look at this initially a bit here. So the ethanoic acid in the sample, and this will be at equilibrium, because it's the equilibrium mixture, reacts with 3.2 of sodium hydroxide solution. Right, now, sodium hydroxide and ethanoic acid react in a one-to-one -one ratio. So, moles of sodium hydroxide, we can work out, because moles is going to be concentration times volume, and that's going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 1 times 3.2 2 divided by a thousand which is going to hopefully be uh, 3.2 divided by a thousand 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4 so there's my initial moles of sodium hydroxide that's going to be equal to the moles of of ethanoic acid in 10 centimeters cubed but I need to know what it is in the entire 250 so therefore I'm gonna go I'm gonna times that by 25 so it's gonna be 6.4 times 10 to the minus 4 multiply by 25 and that's going to give me the entire moles of acid at equilibrium in the entire uh, 250 centimeter cubed uh, uh, flask that we've got whatever it is we say flask flask doesn't really matter does it graduated flask yeah uh, that's going to give me 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 so that's my at equilibrium my time one as I quite like to call it okay that's not going to help us just yet because we've now got to do a bit of a bit of magic because we are told that initially we had 8 times 10 to the minus 2 moles of ethanoic acid. But I know there's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 at the end. So moles of acid that reacted is going to be 8 times 10 to the minus 2 minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 and that's therefore going to be what 6.4 times 10 to the minus 2 am I right am I right am I right, right? 6.4 yeah so that's the moles of acid that reacted therefore moles of ester and water are each going to be as well 6.4 times 10 to the minus 2 so this is what I've got left this is my at equilibrium I'll come I'll come and I'll let do all this in a second. Um, we also need to say, right, so my ethanoic, uh, ethanol, oh, sneaky different different bit of unit there. So my moles of ethanol at equilibrium, well, how are they expected to do this in such little space? Moles of ethanol equals 1.2 times 10 to the minus 1 minus. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 because that's the same amount must have reacted given that it's a one to one ratio sorry no hold on no no it's not at all is it oh terrible no what reacted is this yeah sorry minus 6.4 times 10 to the minus 2 so that's going to be 5. 6 times then to minus 2. So that's going to be at equilibrium. This is a nightmare. Whew. Okay, so at equilibrium, I'll underline the at equilibrium thing. In fact, no, I'll do it up here, a separate thing. So this is at equilibrium. Uh, ethanoic, ethanol ester water ethanoic is going to be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 because we were told that uh, no no we worked that out sorry oh, dear, this is a nightmare so many numbers ethanol is 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2 and the esters there are 6.4 uh, and the water 6.4 times 10 to minus 2. 
Now actually, although we need to work out the concentration, and you need, need to write out an equilibrium expression, you need to do the expression properly for this, which is going to be ester, what is it? Ethylothanoate. Uh, ethylothanoate, I think it is, yeah. Oh, I'm having an absolute nightmare here. Yeah, COO. CH2, CH3, H2O, divided by CH3, COOH, CH3, COOH, yeah, CH2OH, yeah. Now you could convert these to concentrations, but actually you don't need to because the fact that we've got a one to one to one to one, there's no coefficients, all that would cancel. So actually it's quite an easy calculation. You just whack these numbers into your calculation. So it's going to end up be 6.4 times 10 to the minus 2 times 6.4 times 10 to the minus 2 or 6.4 times 10 to the minus 2 squared divided by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 2 times 5.6 times 10 to the minus 2. And finally, you come out with, finally, a value of rounded, and I think it does say appropriate number of significant figures. In this case is going to be three. So you come out with a value with rounded of 4.57. Loads of work in there, but six marks, not difficult working. Just, you know, you've got to keep on top of uh, sort of what's going on. Quite a nice question, though. Quite a good sort of uh, way of working titrations and the equilibrium in the same one. I like that. 4.57. Question 2 continues, I'd hope it would. So a student obtained the titration results given in Table 2. Complete Table 2. Okay, initial, final, so this is just going to be what... I don't know what I've done here. 4.5, there we go. 4.00. 4. 4.2... 4. 3.95... Yeah, calculate the mean titer and justify your choice of titers. Okay, which one would I choose? I'd probably choose one and three, I think. So I'd go one and three. Uh, four, add 3.95, divided by two. Uh, so my mean titer would be, what, 3.98, rounded. Uh, uh, justification, they're concordant. They're within 0 0.1 of each other. Uh, so there we go. Nice and easy. Ignore those two because they're not quite accurate enough. Or, well, those two could be the least accurate. It doesn't matter. Use the data that's given. pH range of three indicators are shown in Table 3. Select from Table 3 a suitable indicator for the titration of ethanoic acid with sodium hydroxide. Right, well, ethanoic acid with sodium hydroxide depends which way around we're actually... If we're starting with, yeah, so if you imagine pH against volume of sodium hydroxide, you'd start, you'd probably start at about 4 and then end in sort of quite high on about 13. So we want a higher end one up here. And so it's got to be this one basically. This one, far too low. The change of this one, this, uh, this equivalence point, this end point would be have to be down here which it clearly isn't. This one around about 7, that would be good if it was a uh, strong acid, strong base, strong alkali, uh, but it's not because it's weak acid, it shifts the whole thing up slightly, so it's got to be this top end. So it's got to be thymol, that's a great looking Y. One mark, reasonably easy there. 2.5, error in the mind, oh. Error in the mean titer of this experiment is 0 0.15. Calculate the percentage error in this mean titer. I always forget how to do this. It's the error divided by your value. So in this case, 3.98 was my titer earlier on. So it's just 0 0.15 divided by 3.98. Uh, of course, times 100 because it is a percentage error. And we get 3.7%, 77 I should say. So you see that in there. Nice, easy one mark. Make sure you can do those easy marks. So suggest how using the same mass of ethanoic acid, the experiment could be improved to reduce the percentage error. So we can't change the ethanoic acid, but actually, and you might not have noticed this in the actual method, it is quite a small volume, a very small volume of sodium hydroxide solution. Ordinarily, that means the error within that reading there is considerably higher 
uh, within the whole experiment really um, than, than you would want it to be. So if we used, we can't change the volume directly, but if we used a lower concentration, that would mean the volume would be greater. So a lower of sodium hydroxide, because you can see here the bigger your reading that you use, Yeah. Oh, what's this about? Yeah. So you can see the read the bigger this reading, basically. I used the sorry about the going three point two, it's these values here, isn't it? The bigger these readings, uh the bigger that. So if that was thirty centimeters cubed as opposed to uh three point nine eight, your error would be 0.5% which is a huge difference so just by having a bigger volume you have rapidly or massively decrease the error used so you want bigger volumes whenever you can um, so in that case we lower the concentration of sodium hydroxide therefore a larger vol of sodium hydroxide required and that would therefore massively decrease that it's not a massive change it is, I suppose it's quite large actually we really want. That's why we use burettes and things because they, you know, they, they really ramp down the um, any of the percentage error that we're going to get. Oh, I like this question. I've seen this one before. Um, so this is thin layer chromatography. It's a very particular. And this is a new new bit into the new specification. Obviously, if you're looking at this in years to come, then it's not going to be that new. But it's a it's a recent change, it's an addition, very much sort of something I think used to be previously in sort of biology and things. It's another way of doing chromatography. Same principle, solvents, blah 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 blah. Things separate and all the rest of it. So what we've got here is we've got part of the practical procedure as given below. Uh, parts of the procedure are in bold text. For each of these parts, consider whether it is essential and justify your answer. So it's just these bold bits here. So one, two, three, four. And we've got four marks there. Do we need to wear plastic gloves to hold the TLC plate? So I'm just going to call them one, two, three, and four to correspond with that. So do we need to wear gloves? Yes. Stops contamination. We've got to give a justification. We don't want all the crap from our hands uh, within our, our chromatogram uh, ruining all our results. That's not going to be good at all. In the developing tank, add the developing sol solvent to a depth of uh, not more than one degree, sorry, one centimeter. Yeah, that is important because if it's too high, it's just going to dissolve any mixtures off the plate. It doesn't want that at all. We don't want that. We can't have that at all. So, uh, yes, this is essential. Um, stops mixture dissolving from the plate. We obviously want the solvent to pass up and take it with it rather than just dissolve it all in one at the start. That would be completely useless. Uh, point three, where are we? Uh, allow the cell developing solvent to rise up the plate to the top. Now, ultimately, we're going to be calculating some sort of RF values from this. So it doesn't really matter at what point the solvent stops because our RF value takes into account the solvent front, the distance that the solvent has travelled. So, no, that is not essential. Provide, you know, we, we can do the calculations regardless. Um, how are we going to word that? So RF value calculated wherever solvent reaches, I guess. Easy enough. And then allow the plate to dry in a fume cupboard. Look back through this. The toxic, the solvent is toxic. Now, a toxic solvent means you don't really want to be breathing it in. And obviously, as it dries, the solvent is going to evaporate. You don't want to be breathing that, so we're doing a fume cover to stop people dying. Four marks, four reasonably easy points there. Nice way of doing this. It, I think it was on paper too. They had this bold bits as well. I quite like that uh, new way of doing bits. Anyway, reasonably straightforward. It's just about knowing the procedure, but also being applying it to this particular uh, particular situation. Loads of room again. Ridiculous. So outline the steps needed to locate the positions of the amino acids on the thin layer chromatography plate and determine their RF values. So we would need to spray with some sort of developing agent. Let me give any more information here at all. 
Okay, we could use UV light. Uh, uh, we're then going to need to measure from pencil line to distance uh, reached, I guess. Uh, we would need to measure. the solvent front itself, that's the maximum distance that the solvent reached and then our RF value uh, we'll call that Y, we'll call that X RF is going to be X divided by Y four reasonably easy marks again, it's probably the more difficult one there but if you just know how thin layer chromatography works you're just sticking it down in the RF value calculation three marks, very very straightforward and that's actually, um, depending on what GCSE you did, that's certainly in the AQA IGCSE this uh, this bit of RF values is there, so that's actually not a particularly advanced um, requirement, I don't think. So x and y, x by y. Explain why different amino acids have different RF values. Well, this is all to do with the fact that, and it's the same of any kind of chromatography really. It's all to do with how fast uh, the particular parts of the mixture travel through the uh, the column or whatever it be. In this case, across the thin layer, um, and that's because amino acids have different as well as any molecules but tends to always be focused around amino acids and that is in the specification actually different polarities and that's based on their R groups primarily you know they've got different R groups different polarities um, therefore spend different uh, amounts of time in stationary phase I guess uh, due to different retentions you could talk about solubility as well that um, depending on the polarity depends on how soluble they would be so some may be less soluble than others therefore they would maybe pass through slower same principle all based around polarities really and how that how that changes sort of the the physical properties um, of the amino acids in this case. Question four, this and then we're at question five, and then we're on to multiple choice. So ethane dioic acid is a weak acid. Ethane dioic acid acts initially as a monoprotic acid. Use the concept of electronegativity to justify why the acid strengths of the ethane dioic acid and ethanoic acid are different. Wow, I've never seen a question like this. Six mark as well. Uh, okay. So you've got to be thinking then, and I think it's probably better in this, in this case, it's probably a good idea to actually draw ethanoic acid uh, just so you can compare it like for like with the ethane dioic acid there. Probably would have made sense to put that over there. Can I, can I move that? Oh no. Oh, this is quite good though. Cut it. Uh, oh no, I can't get rid of it either. Oh, I can. There we go. So that's our ethanoic acid. This is our ethane dioic acid. Now the big difference is in ethanoic acid we have a methyl group. In ethane dioic acid we have another carboxyl group. So it's a double carboxylic acid and hence the reason it's a dioic acid. That's fairly straightforward, fairly obvious. How do their strengths, how do their acid strengths differ? Well this bit here makes all the difference. And this is quite a hard question actually I think. I think it's quite a difficult one to really think about particularly this idea of electron. It does give you the idea of electronegativity there. In this instance here we've got two fairly electronegative atoms. These electronegative atoms have a power of pulling or an effect of pulling electrons towards them from within the molecule, not just within here, but within the molecule generally, they have a pulling effect. So you could call that it's a, an idea of a negative inductive effect. And you've, you've probably come across the positive inductive effect within the idea of carbocation stability, the fact that e e alkyl groups, methyl groups, have this effect of pushing electrons away from them, basically. So they have the opposite effect of electronegativity. So this is drawing electrons towards it. Now, 
if we are pushing electrons towards this, we're getting a sort of more even spread generally of electrons across the molecule. And remember that in, or in order to be a good acid, we want to lose this hydrogen ion. So this one, we'll call it this one rather than this one, but ultimately we want to lose both of them. But we just think about this first one that's being lost and this idea of monoprotic acid. If I redraw this slightly, actually, like that, makes it, makes it a little bit more sense. So in this molecule, what I've got, I've got both oxygens are pulling electrons all the way from here, which actually is creating a much more polar bond here. And that much more polar bond is as ultimately means that it's much more easy uh, to actually lose this hydrogen ion than it is in here where we have this positive inductive effect. So just once more, the two oxygen atoms are basically pulling electrons from the whole molecule, but I'm bothered about this bit from there towards themselves and in doing so they create a more polar region there and that point I mean you could kind of think about almost of it's, it's it's sort of weakening the bond I suppose but it's basically making this hydrogen ion easier to lose which therefore is going to dissociate more freely more easily which means this would be stronger than this one because from the opposite effect this is actually pushing electrons towards and it's decreasing the polarity of that um, and obviously we like polarity because it means things get lost, reactions take place, and we've seen that through the papers and through chemistry and all the rest of it. Polarity is quite good for reactions. So that's essentially the reason behind it. But putting that into words is maybe not the easiest thing in the world, but think about the structures of both of them. If it's ever a starting place of comparing two molecules, think about their structure. You're not given ethanoic acid, but talk about it. So an ethanoic acid, and we could call it the R group if you like, that's what the Mark scheme calls it. They both have this in common. So in ethanoic acid R equals CH3 whereas in ethane dioic acid and I'd, you want to make this point clear that they both have the same carboxyl group so you could say I'll show in a second you could say both are uh, uh, COOH so that that basically gives you quite a few sort of good starting point there, and then it's about talking about this uh, this inductive effect. So it's always comparative ethanoic acid CH three positive in inductive effect ethane dioic acid. COOH or COOH, it's the electronegative gives you a negative effect. Ooh. So how does that affect the actual acid, the strength of the acid as the question is, is asking about? So in there we have a more polarized bond uh, hydrogen always comparative more easily lost therefore stronger acid and that's not too bad of a question I think it's quite a difficult one to get your teeth into but start with your structures think about what they look what they've got in common what they've got different and go from there and that's about all I can sort of say on that one. Draws on the idea and the, and the requirement of understanding the alkyl group there having that pushing effect and the electronegativity of the oxygens having that negative, that drawing effect, uh, quite key. So I'll put that back up there. Going to go on now. Question 4.2, uh, a couple of bits, then question 5, then we're on to multiple choice. So, oh, love buffers. A buffer solution is made by adding sodium hydroxide to a solution. Oh, it's the more difficult one, though. It's the more difficult buffer question. These are tough because these involve you making the buffer, but we'll hopefully we'll see what information it gives you here. Uh, okay, so assume that sodium hydroxide reacts as shown in the following equation in its buffer solution. The ethane doic acid behaves as a monoprotic acid. And we can do that. We can do that. Okay, well we've initially got to work I mean ultimately we're gonna to get to a point where we're gonna where we're gonna write a KA, we're gonna write an expression. And our KA is gonna be for our product, which in this case is uh HC two O four minus.
on H plus, and that's essentially if you look at the previous question, I'm just writing this out. So H C two O four minus yeah over how are they writing it? H two C two O four. So I need to work out the pH. I've got this. I need these two to work out my pH. So what I'll ultimately do is I'll be rearranging this to get H plus equal to uh, Ka times the concentration of the acid molecule divided by the salt portion, ethane dioate. Yeah, I guess it'd be ethane dioate. Anyway, we've got to work out the first bit first, and and this is I, I like these questions in that it, it requires five marks. Quite nice. What you've initially got though is you've got the production of the salt. Normally in a buffer question, you'd have this added along with this, uh, and that would just be your your concentrations. You'd be fine. But in some of them, in this particular one here, you can, you've making the salt kind of in situ within the actual buffer itself. You're making this this salt portion, the ion that needs to be used in the, in the expression. So, we know that we're adding, oh, we're giving the moles of sodium hydroxide to a solution that contains, oh, it's even easier, we're given we're giving the actual moles. So we know initially we've got uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 1 reacting with 6 times 10 to the minus 2. Now, this is obviously limiting, this is a smaller one here, so all of this is going to react and all of this is going to react to produce 6.00 times 10 to the minus 2 CH2O4 minus. And this much is therefore going to be left, which is going to be uh, 4 times 10 yeah it was a lot easier than I've made it out to be. So you've got your two numbers there. Okay, so that's our moles of this remaining. And that's our moles of this. So now what we've got to do is we've got to work out our concentrations of each. Once we've got our concentrations, we should be fine. But can we work out our concentrations? They're sneaky like that, aren't they? They're proper sneaky. They don't give you... They haven't given you a volume, so they're sneaky. Proper sneaky. In this instance, you would you would say that the, so the concentration here of the uh, H2C2O4 is going to be... Concentration moles over volume is going to be 4.00 times 10 to the minus 2 over volume. And here concentration of the HC2O4 minus is going to be 6 times 10 to the minus 2 divided by V. Input those directly into here and what you'll find actually is that the V's will cancel. That's where they that's where they're uh, where they basically they don't need to give you the V because the V actually will cancel there so that's it's not the end of the world. Once you put your numbers in you should get a value of hydrogen ion concentration of uh, 3.927 times 10 to the minus 2. I'm, I've just substituted those numbers in there. I'm just not going to bother writing it out to save time a little bit. Finally, your minus log of your pH. And that's going to give you two decimal places, as always, 1.41 for your pH there. Don't be surprised that it's a low pH. It's it's just what it is, okay? If you're not unsure, work it through again, but don't be worried if pH is sometimes appear low. 4.3. Okay, I'll just, just show that whole thing again. There you go. So I've worked out our moles, what what was initially there, what's reacted. So our moles basically of our acid and of its uh, constituent ion. Worked out our concentrations, which we can't do because there is no there is no V value. That will cancel then when we put it actually into here. Boom, boom, boom times by our Ka value, bish bash bosh, get our hydrogen ion concentration and then pH phi it. 4.3 then, in an electrotation the endpoint was reached when 25 cm cubed of an acidified solution containing ethane doic acid reacted with 20.2 cm cubed of 2 bilirubin potassium manganate solution. Okay, 
Produce an equation for the reaction that occurs and use it to calculate the original concentration of the ethanoic acid solution. Right. I like this. This is good. This is going to require you to be happy, really, with the fact that the in the oxidation here of the and you've come across the ethane dioate ion before and in and that should well that's basically when that is oxidized it is oxidized to carbon dioxide so that's going to be one and you can write this in either format you can write this as I probably would do to be honest I'd probably do it in that in that way yeah you're going to need two half equations you've given quite a lot of room here but I wouldn't go straight into the equation there I'd write two half equations first so in terms of what's happening to the ethane dioic I'm going to call that ethane dioate because that's what's actually going to be reacting that's ce 2042 minus and that is going to become CO2 on my other hand I'm going to have MnO4 minus becoming Mn2 plus now I need to obviously balance all this up so I'm going to go 4H2O I'm going to go 2 in this instance there Yeah, I'm going to carry on back to this one. I'm going to go 8H plus uh, 4, 4, 8H plus 2, 7 plus 5E minus. On this side, I'm going to go plus 2E minus like that. And I'm going to times this side by 5. I'm going to times this one by 2 to make sure my electrons are equal. So I'm going to end up with. 5C2O4 2 minus add electrons cancel so we don't include them 8H plus oh no 16 oh, 16H plus add 2MnO4 minus going to 2Mn2 plus add 8H2O add 10CO2 and that should be the lot Okay, that's that reaction. You could do this with the straight off the H two C two O four two minus, and it would just be a little bit different balancing in here with um with some of the I think the hydrogens involved. You, yeah, you might do a bit more hydrogeny balancing, but same overall sort of concept of of the half equations. Bear in mind this is only four marks. Calculation wise, now we've got to look at this and we can say right. So we've got usual sort of titration stuff here. So we've got. Okay, so we've got moles of MnO4 minus is going to be concentration times volume, which is going to be 2 times 10 to the minus 2 times 20.2 divided by 1,000. And that's going to be 4.04 times 10 to the minus 4. That's my moles of manganate ions. We can then obviously work out our moles of ethane dioate ions by doing a little bit of trickery. We can say that we're going to therefore have, or oh, divide by 2 times by 4, so 4.04 .04 times 10 to minus 4. What did I say? Divide by 2 times by 5, sorry, I think I said 4. Divide by 2 times by 5, so 2 to the 5. That's going to be. Uh, 1.01 1 .01 times 10 to minus 3. I can do what I'm doing here, by the way, because when I actually work this out, each of the H2, whatever I work out of this, it's going to be the same moles-wise of the H2C2O4. So it doesn't matter that I'm using this ionic form because actually it's going to it's going to balance up fine in the end. There's going to be no issues there at all. Um, looking through. This is now my molar value of the ethane dioic ions. Finally, I'm looking to calculate the original concentration of the ethane dioic acid solution. Well, it was initially I had 25 centimeters cubed, so there's my moles value. So I'm going to do concentrations moles over volume. So it's going to be 1.01 .01 times 10 to the minus 3 divided by 25 over a thousand and that should give me 4.04 .04 times 10 to the minus 2 there's a space for it there, look at that 
Marvelous Mercury. Original concentration. Not too bad, that's probably the most difficult bit about this. And then it's just quite a simple ratio calculation going through. Uh, last question now. Question five. Still, they're obsessed with this this chemical. A sample of ethanodoic acid was treated with an excess of unknown alcohol in the presence of a strong acid catalyst. The products of the reaction were separated and analysed at a time of flight mass spectrometer. Two peaks were observed at MZ104 and 118. Identify the species result responsible sorry, for the two peaks. Okay, so... If we're going to have that... Right, so this question's a bit out there actually. And I think you probably you're gonna probably be easier actually drawing this out in full. So this is the ethane dioic ethane dioic acid molecule. It's being treated with an excess of unknown alcohol, so this is a sterification reaction really. It's unknown alcohol, uh strong acid catalyst, so it's gonna be turned into an ester. Now if you look at the MR of this, the standalone molecule the MR is going to be 12, 24, oh, that's where my math is going to fail me massively, 16, 32, 64, 68, 88, 90, I think, let me do that again, 16, 32, 64, uh, 64, 66, 68, 78, 88, yeah, 90. We're told we've got 104 and we've got 118. So essentially we've got 14 more than this and we've got 28 more than this. So let's imagine we're sterif sterificanizer it and we have something added on to here. So now I've added, I've gone down to 89 at this point. So I've got to add 15. Well if I add that that now gets me to my magical 104 because I've got, I'm not going to do it, it's 104. If I want to do another, so that would be one of my uh, species there, it would be this guy here. So remembering that it, of course, has to be a positive ion if it's if it's going through mass spectrometer. So my one thing could be, uh, probably easier to do it the other way around, CH3 uh, O C O C O O H C H three O C O C O O H. Okay, that's one plus. The other option is that both ends sterify sterify jury turn to esters, and that there would be my hundred and eighteen, which is then all I do is I say uh C H three O C O C O O C H three and again positive ion. Two marks there. Quite a lot of thought there because you're not given what the alcohol is. You've got to use your understanding of the fact that it is forming an ester to sort of make that make that leap. And outline how the TOF time of flight mass spectrometer is able to separate these two species to give two peaks. Right. So we accelerate positive ions hmm. there's no mention here I suppose it's not on about the, the formation, it's on about the separation of those in particular, you could talk about making the positive ions you've got the option of the electrospray ionisation which I'd steer away from, I'd go with a high speed electron bombardment or electron gun but you don't need that in this particular instance because it's on about the separation, so they're accelerated um, and the key phrase to use is that when they're accelerated, they end up with a constant kinetic energy. All of the ions involved will hit the same, uh, all, the, all the ions involved hit the same kinetic energy. It's then down to their mass charge ratio as to ultimately the speed that they reach. So they hit the same kinetic energy. Um, MZ104 uh, move faster than 118 uh, therefore 104 arrive at the detector first 
and that's our basically our splitting that's taken place there and that's all you need those three sentences it's on the count to two marks on its own but not a huge amount of work there at all and that's pretty much I was done with half of the paper we're now on to multiple choice so section B only one answer per question is allowed fill it in using the proper correct method there yada yada okay first one at this point we're roughly an hour 55 minutes in something like that so at this point if you're working at the same speed that I have done you would have an hour on this last bit here not so you use that much time but it gives you an idea of you know you want to get through that first bit I think in a reasonable time and leave yourself plenty of time for this last bit anyway which change here requires the largest amount of energy so in all of these we are ionizing our various things and which one of these requires the largest amount of energy so let's have a think and this energy is the energy required to remove something so we would expect generally to remove an electron from a positive ion would probably require the most energy so it's probably going to be one of those two if we look at a periodic table maybe we want to start thinking well what's the size like of a of the helium atom versus or helium ion helium atom versus the magnesium atom or ion. Now a helium is considerably smaller than magnesium, bearing in mind that it's it's not far off just a bloody nucleus, it's, there's, there's nothing there really. Therefore you're removing electrons from right in, and it's that first shell as well, you're removing electrons from right in. Uh, basically it's the last electron that helium's got, so this is going to be by far the greatest because it's that first shell there really high amount of energy required to remove that be much higher than the second ionization energy of magnesium which is just coming from that outer shell still as opposed to being right next to the nucleus okay a sample of 2.18 grams of oxygen gas has a volume of 1870 centimeters cubed at a pressure of 101 kilopascals what is the temperature of the gas so oh, so basically we're doing a PV NRT, we're looking for T is PV over NR. We've got pressure 101, we've got a volume which needs to be converted to meters cubed, remember that. So we're going to have to divide that by a million in order to get to, uh, to meters cubed. So divide that by a million, or that times 10 to the minus 6 would work. Uh, our oxygen gas needs to be converted into moles. Bear in mind, oxygen gas is O2, therefore its MR is 32, not 16. Uh, you've got your R, 8.31. Stick all your numbers in, and you should come out with a value of B there. I'm not necessarily going to do all the calculations, because it's just points you can, you can sort of do all the work in um, there reasonably, sort of easily. But the key thing is make sure your conversions are there. Obviously, that needs to be converted to Pascal as well. So you've got 101 thousand temperature is going to be in Kelvin that's fine that's going to be 1870 times 10 to the minus 6 you've got to work out your moles from that that's given and then through and you're done B it's not too difficult but you know quite a bit of sort of faff in there quite a bit of calculation to do uh, an ester is hydrolyzed as shown by the following equation there's the ester it's hydrolyzed bit of water added in and it turns back into its acid and its alcohol what is the percentage yield of RCOH when 0.5 grams of oh uh, okay right it took me far too long there okay Whew, this is a very weirdly worded question so basically it's asking what's the percentage yield of this um, 0.5 achieved so you need to work out the number of moles of this first off so moles of that would be mass over MR so we're of course given the mass 1 MR of 150, so it's 1 divided by 150. 1 to 1 ratio, so we're then going to times that because uh, it would be masses moles times MR times that by 100 and that would give us our mass of uh, of the carboxylic acid that would give us our mass of the carboxylic acid we then look for the 0.5 there. I'm just doing this quickly 
I'm going to work this out. 1 by 1.50 times 100 it gives us 0 0.66, 0 0.66 recurring as our theoretical uh, mass that we could achieve. We're obviously producing 0 0.5, so 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.66. Um, multiply that by 100, of course, and you're going to get 75%. So it's a reasonably easy calculation there. Strange that you're using these R's, but they are, of course, giving you the MR value, so it's not too bad. A saturated aqueous solution of magnesium hydroxide contains 1.17 times 10 to the 3 grams. In this solution, the magnesium hydroxide is fully dissociated into ions. What is the concentration of magnesium 2 plus ions in this solution? Okay, that's not too bad. So you'd want to look at the fact that dissociates as such. Work out your... I would say work out your concentration of this... Yeah, work out your concentration of this, and it should find it's the same as the concentration of the magnesium 2 plus, which in this particular instance should be D at 2.01. So it should be a reasonably easy uh, calculation. I'm just going to check that really quickly. Concentration is moles over volume, so it's going to be. Oh, you've got to, of course, work out your moles first. So work out your moles of this, which would be your one point, your mass divided by that there. Moles, volume, yeah, it will give you value there of 2.01 times 10 to the minus 4. It's the key thing is it's the dissociation there is 1 to 1. If it was talking about the OH minus, then that would be different, but it's not talking about that. It's just talking about the Mg2 plus, so it's not too bad. Down. 10, the rate equation of the hydrogenation of ethene is rate, yada, yada, at a fixed temperature, the reaction mixture is compressed to triple the original pressure. What is the factor by which the rate of reaction changes? This is a good guy. I did this one the other day. Actually, is a little kind of Kahoot thing. Um, there's sort of multiple choice, and this was the one that I, one of the ones that I use. And that essentially your K value is remaining the same, so we can ignore that. We'll just say that rate is proportional to C2H4. Now, if we tripled that, it would be the same as writing that because it's compressed to triple the original pressure would be the same as tripling the concentration of each well that's if you rearrange that you would end up with three times three so it'll be c2h4 times h2 times three times three which is nine therefore it has to be multiplied by nine quite a nice easy one that one uh, but a nice thought process there of sort of rearranging that when one mole of ammonia is heated to give a to a given temperature, 50% of the compound associates and the following equilibrium is established. What is the total number of moles gas present in this equilibrium mixture? Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, okay. So if you to start with 1 and 50% of that dissociates, that means 0 0.5 dissociates. Oh, look at the ratio. You. So 0 0.5 is going to dissociate. Well, that's a... That's a ratio of one to a half so it's going to be what 0 0.25 and that's one to one and a half so that's going to be 0 0.75 so it's going to be 1.5 yeah it's all about that dissociation there that's a nice question actually horrible ratios but if you just do provided you work at your ratio of one to half one to one half one to one and a half it's not too bad. And then you just add these numbers together. 12. What's change would alter the value of the equilibrium constant Kp for this reaction? No, no. Increasing the temperature, it's got to be straight away. The only thing that changes the constant's value is changing the temperature. No. Next question. What is the pH of a 0 0.02 molten smear cube solution of a diprotic acid which is completely dissociated? So, nice. So we'll call this H2X would be H plus like that easy way of doing it. it could be sulfuric acid obviously our concentration here 0 0.02 well that's going to be 0 0.04 therefore we are going to minus log 0 0.04 which in this particular instance is going to give us 1.4 as our pH easy key thing is the diprotic there and it's the fact that the dissociation is going to give you double the concentration of hydrogen ions there, very important to realise. 
14. The acid dissociation constant Ka of a weak acid HA is the value 2.5. What is the pH of a solution of HA? Get yourself a Ka written out. A minus H plus over HA. Again, assume you know what you're doing so, uh, dissociation wise here because it's got to be one to one, and we assume that there's no dissociation occurred there. And both of these have to dissociate and be equal in terms of their amount. That's got to be H plus squared. So therefore, we could say H plus is equal to Ka multiplied by HA. There's my concentration. There's my Ka. Stick it in, minus log it, and you should get a value of C, 2.98. And keep going. There's a lot of these, by the way. I mean, this is only, there are a huge number of these left. 15. Magnesium reacts with hydrochloric acid according to the following equation. There it is. Student calculate the minimum volume of hydrochloric acid and required. First things first, you've got to work out your moles of magnesium chloride. Standard mass over MR. I'm not going to do all the work in here. There's your mass that's produced. Okay, we're using an excess of magnesium. That doesn't really matter. We're looking at the volume here. That's the key thing. So our mass divided by MR, we're giving the MR, they're very nice in that sense, save you a bit of time. Once you've got your moles of magnesium chloride, what we're then going to do is going to say, right, ratio-wise, it's a ratio of 1 to 2. Therefore, we're going to have twice as many moles of this wood react. Given our moles, given our uh, concentration, we can work out the volume, which in this particular instance comes out to be B. Bear in mind, obviously, you've got these two here, those two that are the same numbers. It's about, ultimately, it's about the uh, the correct standard form used there. So 4.48 rather than 44.8. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2. Because they would give you the same number. That's just not the right way to write standard form. It should always be a number less than 10. And then, obviously, when it goes above 10, you change the, change the index that's there, the power. Okay, so it's got to be B down in which reaction is hydrogen acting as an oxidizing agent so in order to have that it needs to be reduced I can see it straight away it's this one um, that would be zero that'd be zero 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 it's looking for oxygen uh, hydrogen to go down and this one here hydrogens plus one this one hydrogens plus one plus one this one sodium is plus one hydrogen must be minus one just know that the only then there's a couple of changes with hydrogen a couple of changes from it being plus one one of the key ones is a metal hydride particularly with group one where group one always takes precedent with being plus one a little bit of redox there from year one in which reaction is the metal oxidizer oh we're on a proper little redox little 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 go now uh, in which reaction is the metal oxidized that first one is not the case so that's not it because it's remaining as two plus each time this one it's being it's remaining the same. Don't be tricked by the plus there. The chloride is bringing that down. This is still a 3 plus there. The cobalt chloride is going to be 2 plus there, 2 plus there, not there. So it must be here where it's going from 0 to plus 2, I would guess. Therefore, it's been oxidized. So 17 is going to be D again. Quite a nice bit of redox there. Not all the questions are going to be really hard. Some of them are still going to follow on. Excuse me, some of the questions are still going to very much have that year one um, sort of knowledge to them. So this one, conventional representation, which statement is true about the operation of the cell? Right, well, the negative polarity of the of the cell would be normally the more reactive one, which in this case is going to be copper. So we'd probably say that B is not going to be true. Metallic copper is oxidized uh, by silver ions. See, I happen to know that this is the more, I'm trying to remember now, it's uh, oxidation on the left-hand side, reduction on the right. So, metallic copper is oxidized. Yeah, so, the copper is going to go from, it's going to be oxidized because it's going to be the more negative of the two. Uh, and the silver is going to be the opposite there, it's going to be the more positive of the two. Um, this is the side that's going to show reduction based on the, the way that it's been drawn in terms of the conventional representation with the reduction on the right, oxidation on the left. Um, we, yeah, it's got to be A. 
Silver electrode gradually dissolves. Doesn't gradually dissolve. It would. That's ridiculous. Um, also because it's doing the opposite. It's it's going from silver plus to silver, so it's actually doing the, the complete opposite of that internally. Electrons flow from the silver electrode to the copper electrode via an external circuit. Uh, the electron flow would be the opposite way, it'd be from the copper to the silver, so no, got to be A, it's the only one that can be there. 19, an experiment to identify a group 2 metal which is X, 0.102 grams of X reacts with an excess of aqueous hydrochloric acid according to the following equation. Uh, another PVNRT one. Uh, so we're given a volume, we've got a pressure, we've got a temperature, so we're working out the moles. Okay, so basically you're going to work out your moles, you're going to use your mass to calculate an MR. So it's going to be N is PV over RT. Substitute your numbers in. Once you've got your value of N, that N value there is going to be moles is mass over MR. Then mass over moles. Basically, once you've got your n value, you just do your 0.102 divided by n, and that should give you, in this particular case, calcium being around about 40.1 or so. So about sticking numbers again, making sure that you do the correct conversions. That would be 99,065 times 10 to the minus 6. 8.3 one's fine. Your Kelvin's already there. Just about doing the rest of it, converting it. 20. What forms when a solution of sodium carbonate? There's 35 of these, by the way. When a solution of sodium carbonate is added to a solution of gallium 3 nitrate. Oh my god. So, what is formed when a solution of sodium carbonate is added to a solution of gallium 3 nitrate? Alright. This is a sneaky bloody question, this. It's all about the fact that it's gallium 3 and that it's. I can't remember if gallium is GA, but I think it is. The effect that it would be the three plus R, and therefore it acts in this in this particular instance here. Uh, it's ultimately the fact that it's it's acting as uh, it's having that acidic property because it's got a higher charge size ratio, so it's got to be D in that particular instance because oh no, I'll never get my paper marked. It bubbles of carbon dioxide, correct? So it could be one of these two, but it's not producing a more precipitate of carbonate. That would be if it was a two plus, it would produce the precipitate of carbonate, but it's not. It's the three plus. Therefore, we produce the hydroxide and bubbles of carbon dioxide. So nice little tweaky question. You're not expected to know what gallium is, but it's about applying your knowledge on that one very much. So this one's basically we look at the fact that you've got the di the, the excess of dilute aqueous ammonia. It's essentially this one through the idea of the halide test. So it's the it's it's the test the further test. Uh, for the halide precipitates, if you're unsure about the colour, you use ammonia, and that's the first one there would be the silver chloride. Magnesium chloride, get nothing. Copper chloride, you get deep blue solution. Aluminium chloride, you shouldn't get anything in that either. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, that one you'd get white precipitate. This one you'd get a white precipitate, which wouldn't dissolve. That one, deep blue solution. Got to be the silver chloride. 22, what is the final species produced when an excess of aqueous ammonia is added to aqueous aluminium chloride? So, of course, the aqueous here, we're looking for adding it to the... To that thing there. Uh, that one doesn't go any further. Remember, that's the, the hydroxide... A excess goes further in the case of aluminium. The only transition metal that goes further with works with excess ammonia, as I said in the previous one, is the copper, aqueous copper. Aluminium would we'll stop at that. It remains at the precipitate, the white precipitate there. Nothing else happens. 23. Uh, not far off now. The following equation represents the oxidation of vanadium 4 ions by manganate 7 ions in additive solution. There we go, nice redox equation. What volume of 0.02 mole per cubed potassium manganate solution is required to oxidize completely a solution containing 0.1 moles of vanadium 4 ions? Right, so you're given bits of information from each. So you want to completely oxidize 
the solution containing 0 0.01 here. So ratio wise, look at how many moles that would therefore be here. So if this solution contains 0 0.01, it's going to react with 0 0.01 divided by 5, and that would be your moles of MnO4 minus. You're given a concentration of MnO4, and therefore you just work that out. Uh, volume is going to be uh, N over N over C. Find your number there. That's going to end up being 100 centimeters cubed. Not too bad. Make sure obviously you get your units correct on your volume conversions there. You don't mess up and get 10. How many isomers have the molecular formula C5H12? Quite a nice question. So, first of all, we could say 2, 3, 4, 5. Well, there's 1. 1, 2, 3, 4. There's 1. Another one, so that's 2. We could have 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's it. Can't have any other branching. Don't fall into the habit of saying, oh, well, I could do, I could have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, because it's still the same chain, so that would be rubbish. It's got to be 1, 2, or 3. Nothing there. Oh, look, pen gets thinner. That's nice. Right, 24, so that's B. 25, which molecule is not produced when ethane reacts with bromine in the presence of ultraviolet light? Okay, straight away I'm looking at that, and the one that jumps into my head is just this one. Reason being that I'm talking ethanes. Ethanes going to be the bromine. Obviously, going to break, and it's going to be a free radical thing. That's obviously one of the products that could be formed. C2H4, C2H4Br2. So yeah, you could end up with some sort of weird constituent where you're losing a the hydrogen then you're part of the, the radical type thing and then you're getting that joined again C4H10 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 we could find the 1, 2, 3, 4 yeah, we could have two two of those reacting together would give us the bottom one H2 doesn't come from anywhere it's not present in the radical substitutions that's going to go on there how many structural isomers have the molecular formula C4H9Br Oh, so we have one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we could have BR there. One, two, three. So it's three straight away. Three isomers. Three positional isomers. But you could also have one, two, three, four. One, two, ah, oh, sorry. No, it's not three positional isomers at all. There's two positional isomers. One bromo or two bromo. Three bromo doesn't exist. So you could have one bromo or two bromo. So there's two there. You could change the chain, which would in this case be one, two bromo, or uh, be one, two bromo, two methyl, or you could have one bromo, Two methyl, so it's got to be four. Nice question again. I love a good isomer. What is the major product of the reaction between butylene and DBr? D is deuterium and represents H2. Ooh. What is the major product of the reaction between butylene and DBr? So one, two, three, four. Okay, we've got to think. Well, where would our, where would we want our positive to be there? or there we'd want it to be there so our that would be our major our better our secondary carbocation that would be the best bit there that would be the more likely to be the major product formed so therefore we're looking for one two three it's got to be this one it's got to be c surely yeah Can't be the rest because obviously your BR and your D have got to be next to each other because of the fact that 
in this case D would attach there first and then the BR would attach there second just like that the minor product would be those two switches. they've got to be next to each other so it's either got to be straight away you can say it's either got to be uh, C or D <coughs> this would be the minor product D would it's got to be C that's annoying that actually that's even more annoying Yeah, that's a bit better. 28. Why are fluoroalkanes unreactive? So why are they unreactive? Bond is strong. No other way around that. Polar molecules doesn't really explain why they would be that. It's the fact that it's got a very strong bond there. That's it. Nice. Easy. Which alcohol could not be produced by the reduction of an aldehyde or a ketone? Right. It's got to be straight away I'm thinking tertiary alcohol. So which one of these is a tertiary alcohol? Uh... One, two, three, four. So it's probably got to be one like that. Uh, two methyl. I'd say probably B. Because a tertiary alcohol can never become an aldehyde or a ketone, so it can never be therefore produced from an aldehyde or a ketone. So I'm looking for the one that's got the OH group with three alkyl groups there, and it has to be B there with the two methyl butantuol. Which compound forms optically active compounds on reduction? <laughs> right, well this here is going to be... Oh, this is a ketone. Let's draw each out, out quickly and see. That's going to end up becoming... That would work straight away. I think D would work. Well, D does work, so I'm going to go with D. Uh, this one couldn't be because you've got symmetry. Two methyl groups there. That can't happen. Uh, this one again. No, it's got to be D. Nice. That's quite an easy one. Good, good choice. 31. How many secondary amines have the molecular formula? Oh, dear. Uh, C4H11N. Okay, so we've got C4, H11. Finally, after far too much thinking on that one, I realised that you could also have a branch there, so it ends up having to be three. You could have this weird sort of ISO situation there. That took far too long. Which comet has the highest boiling point? Highest boiling point. So we're looking for one to CH3. Straight away, I'm thinking this one. Yeah. That one because it's got hydrogen bonding. No hydrogen bonding, no hydrogen bonding. This one you might think, oh, it's got hydrogen bonding, but it hasn't because it's not bonded directly to the hydrogen. It's bonded to the carbon. Therefore, not hydrogen bonding. This one's going to have the highest boiling point. There we go. There we go. Which comma can polymerize, polymerize by reaction with itself? So this one going to be, it's going to end up in this one here, and we'll end up with the amide linkage. Uh, between the amino group uh, reacting with the cockle group and the sides of the, the carbonyl uh, and the, the amino and making the amide linkage group there, the polyamide. Uh, 34, last couple. A drug is designed to simulate one of the following molecules that absorbs on the active site of an enzyme. Which molecule requires the design of an optically active? What? A drug is designed to simulate one of the following molecules. Which molecule requires the design? Okay, right, I see. Right, I think it's got to be C. Yeah, C. Essentially, the question's asked, and if you find that a bit confusing, the question is basically saying which the following is optically active. So it's got to be this one, because that would obviously, ordinarily, that would be there. Here you've got two H's, two H's isn't optically active. That one's not got enough groups, blah, blah, blah. Four separate groups, it's got to be that one. Finally, and almost end of questions, which amine has only three peaks in its proton and MR spectrum? Right, methyl amine. So let's draw them. One, two, three. Okay, that would have two, so it can't be that one. It took me a while then. Trimethyl amine would only have one, so it can't be that one. Diethyl amine would have one, two, three. That one. It's got to be this one. Uh, just in case you're wondering, 
don't know why I've done this in such a ridiculous way. One, two, that would be mirrored on the other side with the. So this, these two bits are the same, even though this one's drawn ridiculously. One, which would be the same as that one. Two, and then three there. Right, that is it. Paper three done. That's all three papers done in one day. Hopefully they're of some help. Uh, do let me know if not. If there's any problems with those, uh, give me a shout. But otherwise, yeah, I um, hope they've been helpful. Thanks.